Okay, so I guess I'll just get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time to attend this talk today or tonight. Uh, here in Berlin, it's already tonight. So uh, I'm Marta. I'm a developer advocate at Ververica. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about change data capture with Flink SQL and Ezeon. So to start with, for those of you who have never heard about Ververica, uh, you might know it as the company of the people who created Apache Flink, which is one of the most <clears throat> active projects in the Apache Software Foundation these days. And I'm really fortunate to work every day with uh, this great community that is just growing year over year. The project is just getting huger and huger and more and more interesting. So it's a really interesting position to be in. And since the beginning of last year, the company is part of the Alibaba Group, who, if you also don't know, is one of the biggest users, but also one of the biggest contributors to open source Flink um, today. So I wanted to start with a bit of the motivation behind this talk. It's the second time I give this talk, and it's always a very, um, very personal topic for me because before turning to Flink, I was working as a data warehouse engineer and for a couple of years. And this is pretty much sums up what my day-to-day -day work used to look like. So if you were ever involved in building data integration pipelines for uh, analytics in a company that might be running a lot of <laughs> legacy tech, uh, you know that uh, there is a lot of ungrateful things about being a data warehouse engineer. And like I said, there's a lot of legacy technology you have to work with. I don't want to say names, maybe, but uh, there's a lot of technical debt. Um, there's a lot of late, we'll just fix it later data. And with time, you kind of just learn to live with it, even though it leads to like pretty bad results and a lot of pain in your life. So my everyday uh, went a bit like this. Uh, we had this mon monolithic application backed by some transactional databases. For example, if you had like some uh, uh, order system and you would write this uh, really heavyweight ETL jobs to integrate all this data in Bridget and so on to actually make it useful uh, for your stakeholders for some specific business purpose. And in this universe, databases were and are a lot still these days um, seen as these static sources of data records. So it's like this collection of state uh, about your business that is just sitting there and is just waiting to be queried. But in reality, what happens, if you think about it, um, most of the data that is stored in your transactional databases is continuously produced, and it, it's also continuously changing. So it's the logic that you use uh, to query it that doesn't change that frequent, frequently. So although your data is changing all the time, you're querying it almost always the same way. And when you start looking at it from this perspective, you seriously start questioning a lot of things. So if you have all this um, dynamic properties about your data, then uh, why are you giving your stakeholders yesterday's data? And why are you not offloading? Um, why are you not offloading the load on your database along the day, instead of uh, having people wake up in the middle of the night because one of your huge eight-hour running query just uh, exploded because it ran out of memory? And why are we just letting all this data sit there and lose value before we actually process it? And let's be honest, this is like was probably the last thing on my mind every day. I never woke up thinking, oh, I just can't wait to scan a production database for changes using a hundred line query with a thousand business logic conditions, knowing that this query will probably fail at some at some point. And what I described so far is actually change data capture. I know this is 
a very also for me i i didn't use to associate change data capture with something i already did uh, when i first heard about it i thought it was something really fancy and something really new but in essence what change data capture is really is uh, pretty simple and it's been around for a long time so uh, what it is is just tracking and propagating data changes in database to downstream consumers. So whenever you get an insert, an update, or a delete operation in your uh, transactional databases, you want to capture this change and just make it available to, for example, your analytics workbook. And when done right, CDC can be a huge enabler for different use cases, not just I'm, I will focus more on streaming analytics here uh, because that's kind of my comfort zone and it's also I think a very interesting use for change data capture, uh, but you can use it for a bunch of other things. So you can do caching validation, you can do things like syncing between different microservices and so on. And I really recommend that you follow the guy that is actually here and making me very nervous, <laughs> uh, Gunnar, because uh, and explore his collection of talks to learn more about CDC and all these use cases and patterns that, that you can implement with it. Uh, he's the main Debezium guy, the technology I'll also talk about today, uh, and he really has uh, super great insights about, about this topic. Well, about CDC itself, uh, there are basically two ways you can go about it. So the first scenario is using what is called query-based be query CDC. Uh, this is probably what you're used to if you come from a heavy relational database background like me. Um, and what it is is you periodically just pull your database for changes. And each time you just ask, uh, did anything change since the last time I checked? And this has its advantages for some use cases, like it's much simpler and involves much less work. Um, if you want to do something like track, say a slowly changing dimension, for example, uh, but for most cases where you want to react to data as soon as possible and you have you want to have like a really wide and complete um, overview of all the changes that happen in your database, uh, it carries some problems. So the problems with doing query-based CDC is that some data changes might get lost in between these polls. So imagine if you are querying or polling your, your database every five minutes, and in this interval, uh, a record changes states twice. You will only capture the uh, you will only capture the latest uh, change in state. So you kind of lost what happened in between. Uh, in the same way, if a record is deleted, you just lose track of it. You're not able to. It's like it never existed. And there's always this was the source of most of my pain. There's always a trade-off between how frequently you can query your database and the load you're incurring on it. So this is especially painful if you're if you have a if you have to share all this um, all these data sources with other teams. And also, you can really propagate schema changes. So there's a big chance that um, your pipeline will fail simply because someone changed the schema of the source table, but they forgot to ping you on Slack. So there must be a better way to do this, right? And uh, maybe you've also amused yourself at some point. Uh, what if we just tapped into the transaction log? So all the databases have an immutable log that registers all the transactions that have been successful, um, successfully done in, within the system. In Postgres, this is the write-ahead log. In MySQL, it's called a bin log. And for example, this is what a DBA would use for disaster recovery to kind of uh, uh, restore the state of, a database, of the database at some point in time before everything went to, went to space. And this is what log-based CDC proposes. So uh, instead of periodically probing um, your database, you just 
probe this database transaction log and get the latest changes from there. And this guarantees a lot of really nice things uh, if you have like very dynamic data scenarios. So you get more context on uh, the changes that happen and you also get all the changes. So the problem that I mentioned before of deletes or of uh, consecutive updates, uh, you, kind of, um, you kind of get like all the operations that happened no matter what. And since, uh, since you're reading from the log and not the database, the impact that you have in the source is minimal. So it also tackles another, uh, another problem that I, that I mentioned just before for query-based CDC. And uh, you can propagate these uh, changes in near real time as well. And this doesn't mean that there is one right way to do CDC or a wrong way to do CDC. Um, but in this talk, I will explore log-based CDC uh, and why it's pretty cool. So probably the most popular tool out there to do this log-based CDC these days is Debezium. Uh, what's great about it is that uh, it gives you a standard format for uh, change events. So you can process this data in the same way, regardless of where it's coming from. And it transforms, basically transforms your databases into event streams uh, that you can consume in near real time. And the Bezium is there are a lot of ways that you can, uh, that you can deploy and use the Bezium, but typically, um, it is just built on top of Kafka and it provides some Kafka Connect connectors. That's hard to pronounce for the most common databases. So anything like MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB. Uh, I think even Oracle is going to be supported soon or is already supported. And the change events are then pushed to Kafka from where you can basically uh, process them with anything including Flink, which is part of what I want to talk to you about today. So it might be that it's the first time as well that you're uh, hearing about Flink. And if it is so, then I think the simplest form in which you can think about Flink is that uh, it just allows you to continuously consume data from whatever um, data sources. For example, if we have uh, change data events coming in through Kafka, you can just use Flink to consume that. And then it allows you to apply uh, some stateful computations on these data streams. Uh, it builds up some context of the data that it's processing. So Flink has this ability to remember um, the events that it has seen before and apply it to the actual events it is processing now. And then it produces some kind of output. So it can be API calls, uh, updates to a database, other data streams, and so on. And what, what makes Flink really, really powerful is the way it handles this context or the way it does state management that gives you like some really, really good properties, especially if you're working um, at scale and you need things to be fast. Uh, so it gives you properties like low latency processing with really high correctness guarantees. Uh, and what makes it really flexible is the fact that it does this processing one event at a time. So it doesn't batch events, it just does one at a time event processing. And this gives you a great primer. It's like, it's, a very, it's such a simple concept in theory. Uh, that allows you to address really a wide range of use cases. Uh, so from streaming analytics and machine learning to Lambda style event-driven applications uh, to more classical streaming pipelines. Uh, I think these are like the three big buckets of use cases that we see users using Flink from for. And like I said, this event at a time uh, processing gives you the ability to have uh, a lot of flexibility. So as a user, um, Flink gives you different APIs to choose from uh, that trade off 
like how easy it is to use Flink and how expressive you can get in building your streaming programs. So at the higher level, you have uh, APIs like SQL, the Table API, and PyFlink. They are closer to the relational way of thinking about data. Again, if you come from a relational database uh, background, uh, the abstractions are pretty similar to uh, what you would expect there. And these APIs just allow you to kind of cut the, cut the crap and like uh, express your problems in a very concise and a very fast uh, way. And then Flink does all the heavy lifting for you. And as you progress down the API stack, um, using the API starts getting a bit more complex, uh, but you get more and more control over the programs you're building and also uh, how, you, how you're executing them. And when you reach the, the core building blocks of Flink, there really is no limit. Um, if you see out there, there are people doing pretty uh, crazy, crazy scale and crazy use cases with Flink. It really is super, super flexible and very powerful. So for some use cases, you need all this power uh, from Flink. But for a lot of others, you actually don't. And CDC is a great example of a use case that can benefit from the simplicity of Flink SQL. So the nice thing about providing a SQL-based API to do streaming is that everyone knows streaming, right? Not streaming, everyone knows SQL, right? Uh, if you've used the database before, you'll recognize uh, the query that that's in the slide as simply standard or ANSI SQL. And this means that you also know how to use Flink SQL from the get-go because Flink SQL is just standard SQL. And you'll notice the resemblance in, in a bit uh, in the demo or the undemo. Okay, so just so that uh, also to kind of like cover this um, cover the distance between databases and uh, uh, a database engine and a streaming SQL engine. So what's different, what's different about running SQL on top of a streaming engine is that uh, unlike what happens in a database where you run your query, uh, the engine takes a snapshot of uh, the table at the time that the query is run, and then it computes the results based on this static snapshot. Uh, in, a, in streaming SQL, the query is continuous and never ending. So you first deploy your query, and then whenever data is added to the table, uh, results are just continuously updated. So this query will keep on running until you actually cancel the job. So, in a nutshell, I hope you're still following along. So in a nutshell, uh, what Flink SQL gives you is this really high level relational like way of thinking about data streams uh, using a language that you already know. And it's optimized to handle batch and streaming workloads. So with the exact same query, um, you can, for example, um, you can, for example, query a Kafka topic and uh, a, static, a static file on S3, for example. And besides all the operations that you might already know, like uh, joining, aggregations, filters, it also supports advanced operations um, like time traveling, pattern matching, uh, with things like the match recognize clause and all these things that uh, would be pretty complicated to achieve uh, just using SQL, but you can actually do it here. And just in general, with something as simple as SQL, you can build applications that are as resilient, scalable, and consistent as any other Flink application written with the lower level APIs. And you also have a whole ecosystem around Flink SQL that, uh, just makes it really easy to write end-to-end -end streaming applications using SQL and nothing else. Sorry, I got distracted with the chat. 
Uh, okay, so now we can get down to what actually brought us here, Flink SQL and change data capture. So since Flink 111 that was out last July, um, Flink supports to consume uh, JSON encoded Debezium changelog from Kafka, and for now that's, um, that's all it's able to support. Uh, but the way to do this is simply to use the Debezium JSON format in the properties of any Kafka back table um, you create. And then Flink is able to just deserialize the, the Debezium format. Okay, now for, for the fun part. So the last time I did this talk, it was pre-recorded. Uh, so I could do all the cutting and shortening in the world. But this time, because I don't trust my very limited machine and we don't have two hours to wait for things to run, this is more of an undemo with a lot of GIFs, uh, more than an actual video or actually me uh, doing something on my machine. Uh, in any, anyways, the link I shared in the chat, there is a record, there, was a, there is a link to a previous recording where you can see um, me in action for real. Um, if you're interested in, uh, in see it in a different way because here I will not just be coding live, I will just be showing you some snippets and, scre and screenshots to not uh, test my luck. Okay, so this demo is a recycle demo, but we're looking at um, it has some fake insurance claim data that is related to animal attacks in Australia. And what we want to do with this demo is basically get change data capture going, um, pipeline going, simplify some things by using some nice proper or some nice uh, features that Flink has, like integration with catalogs, and then maintain a materialized view that we just then ship to Elasticsearch so that we can see. So we can do a small dashboard on Kibana. So the demo, uh, you can, I, I dropped a link for my GitHub, um, for the GitHub, GitHub repository where you can find the demo. You can try it out. And it basically just uses a Docker Compose setup that you can um, clone from there, easily spin up and uh, what it what it has or what the setup ha does is spin up a couple of containers that are running different uh, services. So we have uh, Postgres that we preloaded with some data, which will be our source of uh, change events. We have Kafka and Kafka Connect so that we can deploy Debezium to get this changed events. Uh, we have a Flink cluster and a SQL client that will allow us to submit some queries to Flink and actually run things. And finally, we're syncing the whole thing to Elasticsearch and Kibana, like I said, so just so that we can see that something is actually happening visually. So the first thing we want to do after we spin up everything, after we imaginarily uh, spin, up, spin up everything, is start our Postgres client that we will use um, a bit later to just do some uh, DML statements. And the first thing we can do is just check what tables we have in there. So um, if, you, if you check the information schema, you see that we have two tables, um, members, which will be the members that just has some uh, reference data and then accident claims, which will be the table that we're interested in tracking the changes. And I kind of want you to, rem to remember that this accident claims table has 1,000 records, just so that you see that things are actually working uh, down the road. So what we need to do next is deploy our Debezium connector. And for that, we'll just post a JSON document with the configuration of our connector to uh, the running Kafka Connect service. And what this should give you back is just basically that configuration of your connector. And to make it a bit easier to read, a bit prettier, uh, your property file looks something like this. Uh, you can see that we're using the Postgres Debezium connector. Uh, we want to track uh, database named Postgres, 
uh, we are using PG claims as like the prefix for any Kafka topic that is created uh, from this. And we are tracking the accident claims uh, table that it just saw before. So what Abysium does the first time it connects to a Postgres server is, uh, unless you tell it not to, uh, it takes a snapshot of where, whatever you instru instruct Abysium to track. So what should have happened um, when you deploy your connector is that Divisium took a snapshot of your table and then pushed all the events into the Kafka topic. And what we're doing here is just basically making sure that that happened. And so we can use the Kafka console consumer to have a look in there and check that we have all those 1,000 events um, I told you about before in there. So this is what this uh, is running in this terminal, it's just basically checking the Kafka topic that we just set up. And cool, this checks out, right? We have a thousand records. And what you see here is a typical structure of a division event. So you'll have the key related information in, that I signed in red. Uh, and then you have the event value information, which is what we're interested in looking at here. So in the value payload, you can see that the before value or the previous state of your event was null. And in this case, it makes sense because uh, all, all the BZM did was uh, read, read what was already in the database. And in the after object, you get the actual state of your records and the database. So what we're interested in seeing next is whether capturing changes with the BZM is working. So is this first pi part of our pipeline actually doing what it's supposed to do? So for this, we can do a series of uh, operations on, Postgre on the Postgres client and see how they reflect on our, Kafka, on our Kafka topic. So here I did a series of an insert, an update, and a delete operation. And you can see that when I do an insert, uh, you get a create, you get an event with a create um, operation in Kafka. When I do an update, uh, you see that you get uh, you see that you get an event with an operation update. And for updates, you can see that now you have uh, the before and the after objects uh, populated. And then delete, same thing. Uh, it just generates an event on Kafka with uh, delete operation. So success, things are working and we can move on. So we cannot propagate this to Flink. That's like the ultimate goal is to uh, propagate all of this to Flink so that we can do some processing on it. So here, the first thing we can do now is start the Flink SQL client when you see the squirrel, it's a good sign, it means it's up and you can start using it. And like I said before, this is basically a tool that you can use to submit queries or um, jobs to Flink. And what we want to start with is we will create a catalog uh, or we will register it with Flink a catalog that will give us access to the metadata of these, all these tables that are in Postgres. And this will make it a bit easier um, further ahead. And next, and most importantly, uh, we want to create a table to consume this change data events from Kafka. So it should have um, the same schema and the same constraints as the original table. And this is what we can use the catalog for. Uh, so you can see here the DDL statement is uh, Pretty normal, pretty normal if you're used to, if you're used to SQL, it's just the same, the same syntax as you would use to create a table anywhere. Uh, but then it has um, the, the part where you specify the connector. So here, uh, the connector that is uh, backing this table. So here you can see that we're using the Kafka connector. We are tapping into our, the Kafka topic. Um, that we defined before, so PG claims, claims, accident claims. 
And then we're using the Debezium JSON format to just deserialize the event. So same as before, I just submit this query using the SQL client and we're good to go. Our table is created and ready to accept some uh, change log action. So this brings us to the next uh, checkpoint. So uh, is the whole thing actually working now, not just from Postgres through the Visium to Kafka, but from Postgres through the Visium to Kafka to Flink? So same as we did before for testing, uh, whether the events were making it into Kafka or not, uh, here, we, here we run the same set of operations to see if the changes are being propagated all the way. So in the bottom terminal, you can see uh, it's, you can see the result of a select star from uh, the change log table that I just showed you. And first time you run it, what you will get is uh, the 1000 records that were in there. And um, you can see that as we run our statements in Postgres, same thing. You see a new record popping up with the insert. Uh, you see that record the receipt for that record being updated uh, with an update on Postgres. And then it just simply disappears because uh, we do a delete operation in the original source table. And to make this um, a really end-to-end -end example and also show uh, Flink SQL in action a bit more, uh, imagine that we want to calculate and visualize uh, the aggregated insurance costs per insurance company, company in, our, in our data. Or basically we want to know what animals are causing the most, the most harm in terms of costs. So now that we, what we can do is that we can just uh, create a sync table that will sync our results or we'll just emit our results to an Elasticsearch index. You don't need to create the index in advance. If it doesn't exist, Flink will just uh, create it for you. And from Elasticsearch, after we have the data there, we can just uh, use Kibana to make some pretty dashboards so that you can see things moving. Uh, and so it's a bit more interesting. So, you can see that the query, again, it's uh, like a query you could run anywhere. You could probably uh, run this directly on Postgres without doing any, any modifications. And it's just standard SQL. We're just doing, like I said, uh, an aggregation of the total claims, total claim costs um, over insurance companies and accident details. So. Once we submit this uh, query, it will, again, using the SQL client, uh, it will just run continuously and continuously update the results on the Elasticsearch index uh, until it tell it to stop, basically. And then in Kibana, you can easily just create a dashboard that refreshes every second. And you can see here, in the original demo, there is, um, a data generator that I triggered just before this so that there are continuously uh, events being inserted in uh, Postgres. And this is the result. So you see um, you see that whatever, whatever data changes uh, happen in Pro Postgres are processed um, through the Visium to Kafka and then in Flink we are doing all these aggregations that we are with, with this change data that then just end up in the in our dashboard in Gibbon. And all of this happens in near real time. So if you try it yourself, uh, you can see that this is pretty this is pretty fast. So that's it for the undemo. Again, if you want to try the demo, please go to the GitHub repository, go for it. Uh, Maybe watch the other video as well uh, if you want to see something that, uh, if you really want to see all the steps, uh, all the steps in, in building the CDC pipeline. And to wrap it up, I would just like, uh, I would just like to say that 
Uh, Flint SQL is used really at massive scale in companies all around the world. So like at Alibaba, Uber, Yelp, Lyft. Uh, I think Alibaba is the biggest um, is the biggest use case we know, or at least that we know of to this day. Um, on their on their shopping festival every year. So like last year, Singles Day 2019, they were running. Um, Flink and their uh, Flink SQL applications on over 5,000 nodes. And uh, they, they were able to produce at peak uh, 2.5 billion events per second, which is, uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. And also, like I, like I mentioned, one of the things that Flink does really well is handle state. And their biggest, their biggest job was, uh, was handling 100 terabytes of state easily. Maybe not easily for whoever was maintaining that, but this this is kind of the scale that it can really take Flink uh, to, and also Flink SQL by yeah by extension. So just a recap: Flink SQL standard provides unified APIs for batch and streaming, so you can do both with the same code. And there's a really growing ecosystem of integrations around it that make it really easy to build streaming applications. And for CDC in specific, uh, like I said, it's very it's a very young feature in Flink. Uh, there are already, uh, Flink 112 is, is coming soon, and it has already a lot of uh, improvements on CDC. So we will have Avril encoded, encoded change logs more than now we only support JSON. And you'll be able to do temporal joins with changelog sources. And also, you'll be able to do batch. Right now, you can only, um, you can only use this for a screen. And Jark, which is the main developer, or one of the main uh, developers behind uh, CDC supporting Flink, he has written a couple of connectors that use the Debezium embedded engine. So uh, these are source connectors for Flink that, that, that allow you to do all of this that I showed you without deploying Kafka or uh, Kafka Connect or the Visium itself. So uh, you can check it out if you're interested. Cool. And if you want to learn more about Flink or hear Jark uh, actually talk more about CDC, uh, you can join Flink Forward. It's our community conference uh, coming up next month, it's for free. So uh, yeah, come around. And thank you so much. I have no idea if I'm over time or, or not, but that's it. Uh, Felix, do I have time for questions? I'm a bit lost in calculations. OK, cool. So um, cool. So there are two questions. Uh, first question, can CDC and Flink be used in batch processing when OLTP is Mongo and OLAP is S3 or Athena? Uh, like I said, batch is not supported yet. But once Flink 112 is out, uh, yes, you should be able to should be able to use it with Mongo and S3, yes, Athena, I'm not sure. Okay, and once I have CDC up and running, which are the most important met metrics to monitor so that I can identify some instability in the setup? That's a really great question that I've never really thought about. So I don't really know how to how to answer it, but I would say uh, yeah, I don't know. I I would say that probably there is something you should look at in terms of throughput, uh, maybe from Kafka, like how how fast events are being. Uh, produced into Kafka and how fast you're able to consume and process them in Flink. Uh, but I'm not really sure uh, what to tell you here, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Will the join be triggered whenever there's a new change event on either side of the join? Yeah, like like Gunnar said, just building on, on the previous answer, I think what Gunnar says, like end-to-end -end delay really is probably something that you should be that you should be looking at. And another question from Gunnar, will the join be triggered whenever there's a new change event on either side of the join? Uh, not really triggered because, uh, like I mentioned, what you have is this kind of materialized view. So everything is handled in state, uh, in the state. So like it's either in memory or in disk, depending on, uh, on the size of your state. Uh, so basically whenever you have a new event, things are just handled, uh, yeah in the background. You don't really trigger the join every time you have a new event. Uh, hope that answers the question. Is there a way to set an initial state for the phone query result that is based? CDC started. Uh, yes. So the Sorry, I, th I think I just mumbled the question. Is there a way to set an initial state for the Flink query result that is based on a data that existed before the CDC started? So um, here what you can do is that you can bootstrap your Flink job or um, the Flink job that will just be created with your query. You can just uh, use a save point or you can probably just uh, bootstrap your job with a save point or something like that uh, in Flink. So yeah, it's possible to bootstrap it with data that existed before. Uh, is Flink able to write to a database in order while consuming from Kafka, let's say? Original database, change data capture, Kafka, Flink, different DB. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, Flink has a JDBC connector, so you can write to uh, any database that supports that. Uh, then you have uh, other connectors available, like HBase. If you want to write to HBase, you can also do that. And what is not supported yet, I don't know if that's your question or not, uh, is actually serializing uh, the events uh, that go out uh, in the Debezium format too. But in the future, this this will also be supported. So you can process your data and then you can serialize it uh, again in the Debezium format. But yeah, answering your question, uh, Flink, if, if, and also if there isn't a connector that is natively supported by Flink, uh, it, it should be pretty straightforward for you to implement your, your own connectors, yeah. Cool. Uh, if that's it, thanks a lot for <laughs> thanks a lot for joining. And if you have any other questions uh, that I'll probably be less nervous <laughs> replying to, you can ping me on on Slack or on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much.